Um, so welcome uh, along to today's webinar. Um, we're, today we'll be presenting the, uh, the results of our 2020 uh, four wheel drive industry research study uh, that was conducted by ACA Research uh, on behalf of the four wheel drive industry council and the AAAA. Um, but for those who don't know me, uh, I'm Nigel Bishop. I'm the uh, membership development manager for uh, the East and North Coast of Australia, so New South Wales, ACT, Queensland and Northern Territory. Um, but I look after our four-wheel drive industry council in, in the convener role as well. Um, today with us, we have Ben Selwyn. Uh, ben is one of the directors of ACA Research and Ben will be walking us through uh, the results of the study. Um, but uh, before we get started, uh, as many of you would be aware, um, AAAA has been fighting a battle for over a decade now um, to remove the technological barriers faced by independent repairers um, in terms of access to manufacturers' technical data. Um, so before we kick off, I'd like to introduce Stuart Charity, the CEO of AAAA, um, to say a few words about a recent development. So Stuart. Thanks, Nigel. Um, sorry to gate crash this uh, webinar, but uh, it is a, a very, very historic day uh, for the automotive aftermarket industry, and for that matter, for the AAAA. Uh, earlier this morning, um, the Assistant Treasurer, Michael Sukar, introduced uh, a mandatory data sharing legislation to the Australian Parliament. Um, as Nigel said, this is something that uh, our industry has been fighting for for, uh, for 10 years. Not The AAA has certainly been leading it, but um, we couldn't have done it uh, with, without the involvement and active engagement of the industry all around Australia. Um, this legislation, once it goes through Parliament, uh, will require every car company uh, selling uh, cars in, in Australia to share full uh, repair and service information with all repairers on fair and reasonable commercial terms. So, as I say, this is an historic day uh, for, for our industry, and I think it will underpin the, uh, the ongoing competitiveness of, of the aftermarket industry moving forward. So. Uh, We'll be providing more information. There's an EDM going out shortly, but uh, I couldn't resist the opportunity to uh, to, to let everyone on, on this call uh, know first of all. So um, thanks, Nigel, and I'll hand back to you. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Stuart. Um, yeah, that's absolutely fantastic news um, for the aftermarket service and repair industry, um, such a significant turning point for competition and consumer choice. So it's um, yeah, really great to hear. Um, I will get back to the main agenda for today um, keep things moving. Um, so the purpose of the industry study was to understand the size of the four-wheel drive aftermarket industry and provide some insights into the product and market trends, uh, the opportunities and challenges. Uh, this is the first such study in, in over 10 years um, and the results are quite, quite remarkable. Uh, they not only provide valuable insights for, for our members, um, they also support the AAA advocacy efforts uh, efforts and particularly um, the data around uh, economic activity. Um, firstly, just a little housekeeping. Um, due to the number of participants on, on the webinar, everyone except for uh, the presenters will, will be on mute, um, but we do encourage questions and I'm sure there'll be many. Um, so please feel free, use the Q&A button um, as your questions arise. There's no need to wait until the end uh, and we'll, we'll have time at the end of the presentation to answer those questions. Uh, and just one last thing, um, everyone will get a copy of the presentation, so there's no need to take screenshots or, or photos on the way through. Um, we'll send that out shortly uh, uh, after the presentation the next day. Um, so with all that said, uh, I'd like to introduce Ben Selwyn from ACA Research to take us through the research report. Over to you, Ben. Cool. Thank you, Nigel. And um, look, also from us, I mean, I guess we've, we've been working with AAAA for a while now and seen the work going on around mandatory uh, data sharing. So congratulations, Stuart and the team on that one. It's been, uh, I'll say, I mean, from what we've seen is there, there, there's been a lot of work going on to get to this point. But um, anyway, as Nigel said, for today, we're here to talk about the four wheel drive industry. Um, yeah, building on, and uh, yeah, the starting point for this was looking back at research that was done, I think, in 2008. So we are yeah, it's been, a, it's been a fair while between drinks for this. Um, we did obviously rely on, on the input from a number of, um, you know, a number of the companies and, and I mean companies, I think, you know, sort of representatives of whom are on the call on the session today. So, you know, very much appreciative of, of, of the data, you know, the, the, the answers they've given us because ultimately that's the input to this. So, um, you know, thanks to, to you guys as well for that. 
Um, so without further ado, I'm conscious of time, let's jump into it. Um, as Nigel said, I'm Ben So, I'm one of the directors here at ACA. We do a large amount of work across the, the automotive aftermarket. We spend our time talking about these things. This is one of the areas that is obviously very topical right now. And, and so nice for us to have been able to, to do this piece to really say, well, okay, you know, we spend a lot of time getting into the, the you know, real details of the four wheel drive sector. But if we step back and have a look at, um, you know, really what it looks like at that more macro level, you know, what is the, the, the current shape and composition? Um, so full report, I'm going to take you through some high level um, themes that come out of it. There is more data that sits behind this. There's obviously more digging that can be done. Um, as Nigel said, we will be leaving some time for questions at the end, but also happy to, to sort of discuss further off the back of this as well. So let's get into it. Starting off with uh, the big numbers and a snapshot of where the industry is positioned at this moment in time. Um, so look, to, to, to put it in front of you, we went through a process to, 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 to get to these numbers. And obviously we completed a survey. We had 84 businesses who took part in that. And they are a range of different types of businesses within the sector, all the way up and down the, uh, the, the supply chain. Based on that and, and sort of matching it up with the previous manufacturer work we've done, ABS data, those sorts of things, our estimate is that there are more than 2000 businesses operating within the four wheel drive space in the aftermarket in Australia. They are turning over $6 billion annually. So, you know, again, this is one of those pieces where it's coming in and saying, look, there is a substantial market. And, and probably I think that was, um, you know, one of the, the, the really positive things to take away is just the size of the market, but also the opportunities that we see for the future. And that's where we will sort of go through this session. Um, but also within it, it's not just about the revenue, it's also about the, the people. And so within those businesses, again, our estimate is that 73,000 uh, people being employed within Australia. So when you talk about their, their input into that, that sort of economic activity within the country, obviously very, very substantial. Now. As I said, um, we did cover off and, and uh, you know, a range of different types of business within the research. And, and there's a couple of points, there's a couple of reasons why that's important to us. Um, so ultimately the way we broke them up, they're either involved in the manufacture, the wholesale or distribution and the retail or fitting of four wheel drive parts and accessories. As you can see from this slide, there is a huge amount of overlap in there. So most of the businesses we spoke to are actually playing in multiple uh, playing multiple roles up and down that, that you know, through that process. Um, but key to this, uh, the manufacturer, and we have done, you know, obviously worked previously with the AAA on, on uh, automotive manufacturing, um, but, you know, 12% of the businesses we spoke to are involved in manufacturing parts or accessories. So that is very much a, you know, a healthy part of the, of the sector. Um, but also really importantly, at the other end of it, 84% or basically almost you know, pretty much everyone that we spoke to has some direct contact with the with end customers uh, in terms of retail and fitting and, and getting that direct feedback. Now, that's really important for us because that is about hearing from the market. Um, you know, what are people looking for? What do people want? What do they like? What don't they like? Where does that next step need to be? And so the fact that that, that, that is happening so broadly, um, we take that away as a, as a real positive. Um, and definitely feeding into, we will talk a bit later on about some of the strategies that people are using or that they're adopting in their businesses. And, and the fact that they are getting that direct feedback, really important as an input to those. Um, but that's, again, so that's the, the businesses that we spoke to. Let's, again, just at a high level, and, and this is one where there is a lot more detail in, in the full pack, but just looking at some of the products that, that, that are uh, being manufactured, being sold in the Australian market. and. The main thing to take away here for me is just the diversity that we've got within that within that offering. So, you know, this is this is not talking about what uh, proportion of sales there are. It is just you know what is being sold, what is out there. And, and so, as you can see, I mean, we're we're going. You know, we've got some some fairly standard accessories. We've got accessories that go into into more of your your more you know proper off roading four wheel driving. We've got engine upgrades. We've got um, you know, other vehicle upgrades such as your lift kits, um, lighting. I mean, so really, I mean, you know, covering off such a diverse range of product areas. And um, 
Yeah, I think I think that just really sets the scene for us so that, that when we talk about the industry, and one of the themes that I will keep coming back to is the diversity that we see in terms of the products, in terms of the strategies, in terms of the growth opportunities. There are a huge range of opportunities out there. And each business, you know, the different businesses do seem to be working hard to find their particular niche. So looking for the future. So, I mean, that's very much about where are we now? But what we also did was we looked at the future and said, well, okay, so, you know, what is happening? You know, what's happening with four-wheel drive? We know that, you know, I can look at, uh, you know, new car sales and tell you that four-wheel drive is growing based on the number of utes that are being sold. Um, and, and, you know, that the parts and accessories market will, you know, work off the back of that. But that's all historical. You know, what are we seeing in the future? Where do we think that we're, we're, we're going from here? And so obviously we asked those questions as well. At an overall level, across all of the businesses we spoke to, they're predicting double-digit growth in sales of uh, four-wheel drive parts and accessories over the next two to three years. So, you know, we're on a journey. We have not reached the peak. That, you know, that is continuing. There, that, that, that opportunity is continuing. The other cut that we put on this slide is saying, well, okay, focusing specifically on our manufacturers, because it's actually really, really interesting here, uh, because a lot of them are not just manufacturing four-wheel drive parts. They also have a broader offering that, that services the, uh, the aftermarket, services the automotive community. And that's important because if we look at the growth they're predicting within four-wheel drive, as against the growth they're predicting within the business more broadly, they actually expect it to double, you know, to, to the, the four-wheel drive growth will be twice what they're going to see in the, in the broader business. So um, look, again, I mean, for us, you know, as, I, as, I, as I was saying, I mean, that talks to the opportunity, it talks to the, the trajectory that we're on. Um, now, of course, the reality is that that's not going to be easy to achieve and um, you know, it's not going to fall into their laps. And so there is a lot of work that needs to happen to achieve that. So what are some of the strategies that these businesses are using to try and um, achieve this level of growth? And again, look, talking about them at a high level, but uh, what we can see is there are different, um, different avenues that they're using in terms of growing sales and growing revenue that side, but also in terms of how they can make their business more efficient and more effective. So working across with these, the first two that we've got there, developing new products and product range expansion. So we're talking innovation, we're talking new product development, either broadening or deepening their uh, reach into the car park. So um, you know, when I was talking about that feedback, that direct feedback from customers, you know, if you know what people are asking for, you've got a guide as to where you should be going. If you know what vehicles are out there, similarly, I mean, you can you, you can plan your innovation, your new product development more effectively. Um, but so they're, you know, they're thinking from that perspective. Marketing and promotions, um, you know, and also probably developing e-commerce platforms, um, which is about, you know, building that demand and having, having those, those different routes to market. Um, E-commerce platforms are really interesting one. Obviously, everything that we've seen over the past 12 months with COVID is there's been a huge amount of online, uh, online activity. I, I know, you know, financial reporting I'm seeing out of some of the big chains is that, um, you know, that holds true for automotive just as much as anything else. And so, um, you know, some of the, the businesses we've spoken to have said, well, okay, let's take advantage of that. Let's have our own direct to market strategy. Um, and so, you know, different approaches that they're taking there. And then the final one that we've got there, which is more obviously an, of an internal perspective, but saying, okay, we need to in increase our production capacity, invest in our facilities, we need to introduce more automation, we need to be more efficient in terms of how we produce and, and you know, get, the, get, get these parts to market. Um, so I said, a range of different ways that, that, that these businesses are going to achieve the growth, but ultimately it does feel that there is a level of thought going into it, saying, well, okay, what is right for us? Now, again, this is not going to come without its challenges. So albeit that they're, they're, they're doing all of this work, there are still some, um, I guess, more macro challenges, industry challenges that need to be faced. Um, you know, obviously the first two on the list here, um, have, uh, I know the AAA has been doing a lot of work around them and they were talking to the, the lack of harmonization between different state regulatory bodies. And, and also I mean, the fact that regulations in some cases just aren't really in line with what people are asking for or how people want um, you know, work to be done. So look, I mean, this is, you know, these are industry issues. This is, um, you know, this is a known problem. This is, you know, there is work being done around these. 
Um, but it's recognizing that this is, um, you know, this will be a constraint and it is something that needs to be managed. Uh, third on that list, and I'll be very, very timely for Stuart to come on and, and sort of be talking to the, the legislation going before Parliament, um, but, you know, advances in vehicle technology. And so having access to um, the uh, vehicle data and being able to, to, to actually do that, you know, through the, 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 you know, the right channels as, as against having to try and work around back doors makes that a lot easier and makes that, you know, makes that a lot easier to manage. And then also copies or, or counterfeit products, which an interesting one, probably not one that we expected to come through so, so strongly. Um, I do wonder whether this is a, um, you know, one that's coming off the back of last year, off the back of, you know, probably a lot of uh, people at home, you know, doing some DIY and, and you know, they sound in mean, the stereotype of shopping on eBay, buying some cheap parts and finding that they're not getting what they, uh, what they thought they were. Um, so, yeah, will that be an ongoing issue or is it more about a moment in time? Hard to say right now, but, but I'd say that's, that's probably got something to do with that one. But, but hopefully, you know, we know that Australian companies are producing high quality parts. Um, and, and so, you know, there's, there, there's a level of value that's being delivered there. And so, you know, using that to overcome that challenge. Um, but ultimately, look, all of that does set the scene for a, um, you know, again, a, a positive trajectory there, there, you know, there is a level of thought going into this, but it is about the industry also working together to try and address some of these issues. Now, moving through that, and so um, with that, I mean, that's very much focused on the business performance. Let's jump more into, you know, the, the actual products that people are using, or sorry, the products they're selling and What's that to you know where they're coming from as well, and, and so obviously that whole piece around local manufacturing and and you know local sourcing of parts and accessories. Um, but what we saw in the research is that of the businesses we spoke to, the majority of them are actually uh, using locally produced parts and accessories. So again, talking to you know it's not just about a business that sits here, but they are you know they they have relationships with Australian businesses. They are looking to to build that into their supply chain. Um, when we looked at the countries of origin, Australia number one, uh, Thailand, China two and three, obviously, you know, all known you know, automotive, automotive manufacturing regions there. So, so you know, sort of makes sense they come in. But uh, again, I think, you know, what we saw when we did the manufacturing work a couple of years back was that there did seem to be a lot of, you know, an increasing amount of sort of small specialist manufacturers in Australia. And, and so this does say that there are opportunities for them to be selling into some of those larger, larger networks. Looking specifically at manufacturing, um, of the manufacturers we spoke to, the vast majority of them have at least some of their um, you know, production facilities in Australia. Many of them do also produce offshore, um, but they, they, they have that local operation. They are producing a decent proportion of their products here. And importantly, they're also sourcing raw materials here. So again, it's you know, that broader economic impact and, and Obviously, for the AAA guys with the advocacy work, I mean, that's a nice story to be able to tell. But I think also for businesses just saying, look, there are, you know, we have seen a whole range of challenges with, uh, you know, supply chain issues over the past year, which, we, which are continuing on now. And so, you know, the more we can have our, um, you know, insulate ourselves from that through the use of local suppliers, obviously, that's got to be a better. And I think that's very much reflected in the attitudes that we see, regardless of whether businesses are currently using or not currently using Australian made products, um, there is an appetite to, to shift more of that onshore. And so again, you know, it does appear that there is a demand there for uh, Australian made. Now, if we're producing it, we obviously need to send it somewhere as well. Um, whilst there is a lot of demand within Australia, there is also a huge opportunity beyond these shores. And so we looked at the export markets that people are selling into, but also where they see opportunities in the future. At a high level, so the, the blue, um, blue lines here is um, primary export markets. The gray then shows where else people might be exporting into. Primary going to be judged on the basis of I send the most you know, product there in terms of tonnage, I, I'm you know, generating the most revenue, whatever it might be. Um, but ultimately, you know, you know, USA, New Zealand, um, you know, you've got Europe and Middle East where, where there's obviously a growing market or particularly the Middle East will come back to, Southeast Asian markets, and then some of the, the, the sort of small ones a bit further down there. But still, again, I mean, you know, there are businesses who are selling into each of these markets. And so there is a wide range of export activity 
that we're seeing here. Um, looking to the future, there is also uh, plenty of opportunities for growth, again. And um, I think what's interesting here is to look at where those opportunities are. And um, so the four that we, we, we've called out here as being the, you know, seeing the, the highest growth potential over the next few years, um, the UK, South Africa, um, the Middle East, as I mentioned, you know, that I mentioned before, but then also Africa more broadly. And, and so interesting that those are being called out over some of the other markets. And um, so, you know, it's then saying, well, okay, what is it about them that uh, has attracted people to those? To those markets or that, or that, that leaves them seeing an opportunity. Um, five main aspects there. Um, firstly, they talk to a similar car park. Um, now, that could be either in terms of the type of vehicles. So obviously, the USA, they love their trucks. And um, you know, I know there's a whole bunch of manufacturers who are over at SEMA shows and, and sort of very engaged in that market. And, and, and so that's you know, one avenue. Also, I mean, you've got New Zealand there in the comment, but also the UK right-hand drive markets. And, and so, you know, just similar in that sense where they're, you know, obviously some of the uh, logist logistical issues that you might have with other vehicles don't exist. Growing four-wheel drive interest um, and an expanding target market in terms of the people who are actually looking for the, the product. So there's more of the vehicles, but there's also, you know, people who can afford it and who want to engage in these sorts of activities. And so that's more of a cultural question of, you know, is this the right sort of area for what we're, we're selling? And then also a gap in the market. And I think that's one of the key points for some of the, the, the markets we saw on the, the slide before there, that, um, you know, they don't necessarily have the local manufacturing of the standard that we can offer in Australia. And so I think, again, that's talking to that, that sort of positioning Australian four-wheel drive manufacturing and the strength of the offer that we've got here. And finally, I mean, Southeast Asia obviously has some of them, the geographic piece where, where it's much easier to feed into. So a very quick summary of the research. As I said, a whole lot more detail in there, but we did want to leave some time for questions. I'm, I'm conscious that I have eaten up a little bit of that with my talking, but um, would like to throw the uh, throw it back to the floor. I can see some questions have come in, but um, yeah, Nigel, I'll, I'll throw back to you. Yeah, great. Thanks, Ben. Um... Yeah, look, it's some really fantastic data coming out of that um, that report, um, but also just uh, um, really great to hear from yourself in that sort of deeper dive into what the what those um, what those numbers mean. Um, yeah, great to see not only the total revenue and employment figures um, where they are, but in terms of business confidence, um, that seventeen and a half percent expected growth. Um, and the appetite for Australian manufactured products, but um, we do have a few a few questions that come through. In fact, the first one kind of leads leads on from from that from from Ian. Um, and the question, Ben, is while you're expecting double digit growth, seventeen and a half percent, what's the expected market size for for the four wheel drive accessories? And is there a further breakdown of that um, growth expectation in terms of the different product categories, suspension, etc.? Yeah, that's, uh, you know, hi, and that's a good question. Um, look, we're, as we say, I mean, at the moment, the market's at that $6 billion mark, um, you know, that prediction, I, mean, I think that is over the next two to three years. So, um, you know, that adds, um, you know, potentially a, a, another four or 500 million, um, or sorry, no, my maths is flawed. It adds, you know, obviously adds on to that. The... So we, we can look, yes, I mean, we can do the, the maths around that. Uh, I think the note of caution I put on there is, is that is, as uh, Nigel was saying, more of, you know, it's a measure of sentiment. It's a measure of what people think they can achieve. Um, so, you know, something that we'd love, love to do is come, come back and say, well, okay, what did they actually achieve and how does that compare to the market more broadly? Um, but, but yeah, I mean, definitely possible to make some projections as to what that might look like. Uh, we can't break it down by uh, product category though. The way the way the questions were asked, it, it does sit at that overall level. All right, thanks, Ben. Um, just another question from, from Ian as well. Um, uh, okay, so he's asking of the new four wheel drive sold, do you have a breakdown of how many of these have accessories fitted? Um, I guess, you know, is, is there any data around the correlation between new vehicle sales and, um, and you know, that revenue from, from the accessories uh, market? No, I mean, look, that, that's, um, again, I mean, you know, that, that, that's uh, a piece that we, we've sort of talked about at different times, but have never actually done. I mean, 
uh, you know, I'd say, uh, you know, everything I, I've seen suggests that it's going to be a pretty high proportion have at least some accessories. And I mean, you know, remembering that the, 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 you can be going down and saying, well, okay, you know, how many utes are there out there that don't have a tow bar or a bull bar or, or something like that uh, on them. But then it's obviously once you get into the more, uh, more complex or higher order, um, you know, parts and accessories where, where, where it's going to get smaller. But, but yeah, no, don't have any number I can share there. Um, but yeah, as I said, my, my assumption is going to be pretty high. Okay, thank you. Um, we've, we've got another couple of questions to get through and um, just mindful of time, we'll try to get them through them as quickly as we can. If any others do come up that we can't get to, um, we're, we're happy to, um, to follow up with, a, um, with an email response um, to you. Um, so David's asked the question, for those businesses going down the e-commerce uh, route, which was one of the areas highlighted as a um, as um, you know, growth for business um, in the upcoming years, um, do they face channel and current customer conflict and how do they address this? That's a, that's a really difficult question <laughs> to answer. Um, yeah, look, I mean, I'll, 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 I can attempt to answer part of that, I guess, which is that, um, uh, E-commerce is is widely recognised these days as as a as a vital piece of that um, uh, that retail um, you know, channel, and I know that it's uh, it's certainly over the last few years has has evolved um, into into being that key key piece of of the retail retail puzzle, um, and I know that you know, many member businesses will be having um, you know discussions with their supply chain about the need for them to be present in that um, in that e-commerce. Uh, market because it is such a such a huge um, uh, such a huge growth area. Um, but ben, is there any um, I guess sort of insight from from your perspective? Um, yeah, look, I mean, we didn't we didn't get that into into that in the research in terms of if they you know if that is a strategy they're adopting, then then who are they targeting with that? But I think that's the key part of it, because obviously, I mean, David, as you as you all know, I mean, you know, vast majority of the uh, sales happen through intermediaries, so wholesalers, distributors in, into the retail environment. Um, my, let's say, I mean, my assumption here is that in a number of cases, they are going to be using this to try and tap into to some of that DIY activity and, and do that directly. Now, we'll see whether there's sensitivities there with with um, other channels that they're they're using to, to sell parts into, um, yeah, it's a, a, a question there. Are they going to be doing, um, you know, are they going to be introducing an e-commerce platform to sell into trade? I would have thought that would be less likely just because, you know, the, um, you know, the purchase channels there are, are so much more entrenched and, and you know, just, you know, it, it just works really well. So, um, yeah, I mean, that, that that's probably the assumption, but yeah, we don't, we don't have any data to, to sit behind that. Yeah, thanks. It's a tricky one, um, and I think uh, you know probably one of the key things is, is um, you know open conversations between you know, suppliers and and um, you know and their supply chain around just what e-commerce how that fits in with their with their business. But but it is a tricky one to to answer. Um, I'll uh, I'll just move on to we've got one final question and we're we're getting close to time um, from Matthew. So how do you see these growth numbers impacting on wages and availability of skilled labour? Yeah, look, I mean everything we're seeing and and you know the the work we've been doing with the AAA for years um, has talked to the challenges that that workshops of all sort all, all sizes. And, and all types of, of workshops, whether it be service and repair, or, you know, sort of modifications, or all of that, are facing in terms of finding uh, skilled labour, whether it be techs, or also going up to to, to your manufacturing production. So, um, you know, the the labour challenge is going to be something that that, that does impact the, the these businesses when they're trying to achieve these growth numbers. Um, I, I don't think it creates the issue. I think the issue is already there and, 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 you know, there's work going on around that to try and work out what, what can be done to, you know, to attract people into the automotive sector as against other trades or other, you know, other options they might have to them. Um, but yeah, so, so, you know, I mean, it's, you know, yes, it's a challenge, but um, as I said, I don't think it's a new challenge. Yeah, thanks, Ben. Um, it's probably um, just a, a good one to end on there and just to mention that, you um, that one of the initiatives that the Four Drive Industry Council is actually currently working on is a um, 
is an accreditation course for four-wheel drive accessory technicians. Um, in fact, it's it's uh, taken uh, been quite a big project and is, is about to kick off with a pilot program late in April to address that that skills shortage and create a um, uh, address the gap in that that training market um, you know, and create a, a pathway for for people in that sector in the four-wheel drive sector of the industry. Um, well, we're, we're pretty close to time and, um, and we've managed to get through all the questions. Um, so I'll once, once again, um, thanks Ben for, um, for taking us through the results and, and, and highlighting the significance of, of, of those numbers and taking a bit of a deep dive into, um, into some of the data. Um, you know, really insightful stuff. Um, and thanks to everyone on the line for joining us today. Um, I hope you got some value out of attending um, the presentation um, and please look out for an email from us uh, within the next day or so with a copy of the report. Um, so that's it. Thanks again. Um, hope to see you again soon. Thanks guys.